The following podcast is a presentation of Project I Radio 24 7 Nergasm. <laughs> No comment! Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f***! What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over! No comment! The f***! Brian Keane was also unavailable for comment. Welcome back to The Horror Show, brought to you by Project I Radio. I'm your host, Brian Keene. With me, as always, Mr. Excitement himself, Dave Meteor Notes Thomas. Oh, good day, everybody. I was driving up here today, and I was enjoying all the fall colors, all the orange. Oh, wait, that's the traffic cones that lined every inch <laughs> of this godforsaken <laughs> hellhole of a state. <laughs> and with us also in the studio today, our returning occasional co-host, Jeff Coop Cooper. Well, thank you very much. I'm here yet again. And I, I just had to wait in traffic. I, I, I got waylaid by an errant uh, tractor. At least was, it wasn't a horse and buggy. It was yeah. not a horse and buggy. <laughs> no, those are on the other side of the river. This week's episode of The Horror Show with Brian Keene is brought to you by Stephen Kazanowski. Remember him? Yes, he was yes, a guest. Yes, he was a guest, and now he's an advertiser. We like that. I like that a lot. I'm talking to you especially, Edward Lee. You should be spending more <laughs> money to advertise The Walking Woman, just like Stephen. From October 8th to the 10th, all three of Stephen's novels are on sale. That means that for just 99 cents, or free if you're a Kindle Unlimited user, you can get a copy of Billy and the Clonosaurus, a dystopian satire in the vein of 1984 or Fahrenheit 451. Billy and the Clonosaurus is about a future Earth populated entirely excuse me, I had to burp there, by identical clones. When one clone misses his mandatory execution after a single year of life, he sets off on a journey to uncover his world's dreadful secrets, accompanied by a dinosaur-like monstrosity cloned from a roast beef sandwich. According to David Sharp of the Horror Underground, Billy and the Clonosaurus is a complex, thought-provoking story that is oddly inspiring. Kazanowski is a rich voice that booms over his peers. I am coming to think of him as the closest thing to the reincarnation or spiritual successor of Ray Bradbury. Get your copy on Amazon.com today. And I should mention, Kazanowski is spelled K-O-Z-E-N-I-E-W-S-K-I. Because apparently they were giving out a lot of vowels that day. Uh, apparently so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to him for that. Uh, later in the show, gentlemen, we have an exclusive two-on-two -two interview with the legendary F. Paul Wilson and Thomas Monteleone. Uh, one of the best interviews we've ever done. I think that it's going to be yeah, awesome. I think it's the best. It's, to me, it's tied with the Edley one. I can't decide which one I like yeah, better. I think yeah. you know we're almost forty episodes yeah. into this show, and I I think this interview absolutely captures everything we ever wanted to do with this. Oh, no, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, after that interview is over, by popular demand, uh, we will have a spoiler-filled discussion about Paul Tremblay's A Head Full of Ghosts, which is, of course, the horror novel that everybody's raving about this year. Um, if you have not read it, don't worry, you're safe. We'll tell you when we start that spoiler discussion. It'll, It'll be the last thing on the show. show. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dave, I'm going to get Coop some coffee. Okay. Um, I should mention that Coop's coffee, once again this week, is brought to you by White Castle. Uh, <laughs> if you're in a if you're in a state where they have a White Castle, then then you should eat there. Um, that's really the limit of the ad copy I have for them because, as we've said before, while White Castle was very happy to provide the show with 
with ceramic coffee mugs and t-shirts and other swag, they will not spend money. So, Dave, how was your weekend? Um, I had several things going on. Uh, first of all, you guys have heard me talk about uh, Prog Power USA the last couple weeks. About yeah. the tickets went on sale. Well, tickets went on sale on Saturday. Nine hours later, it was sold out. Fastest, I saw that. Yeah, it was like fastest sellout yeah. history by far. I think as you predicted I, that on I, the show. I did predict that on the show. Um, and one really cool thing is I get a message from somebody, and I'm not going to say his name because I don't know if he wants me to say his name on the air or not, but uh, someone listened to the podcast. Yeah. And he sent me a Facebook message and said, hey, man, I just want to let you know that uh, I, I listen to the show every week and I heard you talk about Prog Power, and I never heard of it before, so I went and checked it out, and it sounded really cool, so I bought a ticket. So I'm going to be going. Nice. Which Excellent. I thought was Very awesome. Good. Yeah, no, I thought that was really cool. Um, I'm sure there's some other people out there that listen to the show that probably did that. Um, so, yeah, it's sold out. Um, so now there will there's always a secondary market for tickets, especially like next summer when it gets closer to the show. I have to buy one for Phoebe, so I'll be watching that because um, she is going this year. And uh, So you bought me a ticket, but you didn't get Phoebe a I ticket? I did not buy you a ticket. <gasps> where exactly am I supposed to get the money from? My, my hidden gold mine in the backyard of my house? Well, <laughs> Stephen Kozanowski bought an ad this week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that'll that, – that, you know – I, I had to buy a phone, which is the first time in four years. Like I bought a phone, but yeah. Well, I just, I couldn't get a ticket because right. I was, oh, you got a new phone. No, it's yeah, it's on the way. I've I got the new iPhone because my I have a four S. No, I know. I yeah. remember when you got it. Yeah, four yeah. years ago. That's yeah. like you buying a new phone is like Clive Barker coming out with another short story collection. You know? <laughs> it's like twenty five years in both cases. You know, these for me paying ca- paying actual money for a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, here's I, you know you need a phone, but my thing is I, I want to get as much use out as possible because they're not cheap. So um, I, I keep it till basically is on desk door, and, and so I ordered a new one. So yeah, anyway, Park Power is sold out, and uh, also last week. Um, by the time you hear this, the, the replay will have happened too because replay is is today. Uh, me and Phoebe go to that Rift Tracks live every year. For those who don't know what Rift Tracks is, it's some of the guys from Mystery Science Theater, right. and they do live broadcasts at theaters and movies. Last week's movie was Miami Connection. Which the best way to describe it is if you've ever wanted to see a movie about a rock band that knows Taekwondo and fights drug dealers and ninjas, this is the movie for you. Well, um, everyone and, yeah. wants to see yeah. that. <laughs> it's actually it's, the whole movie's on YouTube if you want to watch it. It's hilarious. It's like it's made it's an eighties movie, obviously, well, with that yeah. plot line. So it knows hilarious. <laughs> but the funniest line of the night was not delivered amazingly enough by the Rift Tracks guys. It was by Phoebe. Really? Yes. Who during the presentation of the movie about a third of the way in, she just blurts out all of a sudden, that guy looks like young Brian Keene. And one of the many drug dealers slash thugs in the movie looks like, Brian, that picture of you by your van with your mullet and everything. Oh, with my mullet? Yeah. yeah. No shirt on. Yeah. Look exactly like it. That was it. We laughed for at least five minutes after this guy was on the screen. <laughs> Did the actor have the porno mustache yes, too? Yes. Yeah? Yes. It was, oh, it was absolutely amazing. So I would, I highly recommend everybody watch that movie. I also recommend everybody check out Rift Tracks if you've never seen it, especially like Mystery Science Theater. Um, so there's that. And another quick uh, bit of information. I'll just do this really fast. I have my uh, year checkup on my heart. Yes. And I have my scans and all my stuff done. I don't have to go back to the cardiologist for a year. Everything's good. So. Yay, red love, double so thing in chest. Sure everything else is failing, but you're well, yeah, okay. I, the heart is fine. So I thought it was kind of odd that they did it because technically the surgery was in November, so that's technically a year. But I guess it's close enough. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how doctors work, but but the good thing is, there's at least one doctor I don't have to see for a year. So uh, that Excellent. that's good news. Excellent. Other than that, we did nothing. We made this awesome roast beef in the crock pot. Did you clone it? No. no. <laughs> I did not. I didn't think of that. I wish I would have. We, I finished it yesterday. I'm like, damn, I wish we would have made two of these. <laughs> it was really good. So other than that, it was a weekend of hiding in the house from humans. Well, good. Yeah. Good. And uh, I think you went to, uh, which I, I sadly missed out on, the the Merrimack? The Merrimack Valley Halloween Book Festival. Yes, yes I did. That's that was the thing that the, the Golden was going to Yeah. Go um, yeah I'm that... not worried that nobody's going to come. And... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's talk about that. Yes. Yeah. Um, I drove up to Massachusetts on Friday. Now, that's usually a seven, eight-hour drive here from Pennsylvania, except that I'm like that character in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series, the Rain God. Remember uh, yeah. that rain followed him everywhere he went? It started fucking raining here in PA the moment I turned on the ignition, and it <laughs> rained the whole way to Massachusetts. And it took me 13 hours. Uh, 13 hours to get uh, there. Death. Um, oh, death. But, you know, Rio Ewers had a, a beer waiting for me, and it was all good. But uh, 
Yeah, Chris Golden organized it. Um, it's in a, a theater uh, where they are currently putting on a production of Susical. So <laughs> our background yeah. for the entire weekend was all Dr. Seuss. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in fact, if you go on uh, BrianKeen.com, you can see uh, there's a picture of Jack Haringa and Chris Golden and I standing in front of the Seussical setup. And there, there's a great close-up of Joe Hill and myself in front of it as well, which people have been making memes out of all week. But, uh, yeah, it was it was the first year, and Chris was nervous, and I'm not going to make fun of him for that because, you know, I've... Well, we have three guys with beers to make fun of, so we don't need exactly. to make fun of uh, You know, I, I've, <laughs> I've helped organize countless conventions at this point, and it is. It's nerve-wracking. Um, but, yeah, he was worried that nobody was going to show. And I told him, I said, you know, look at the the list of authors. No, I said, was, Joe oh, Hill, yeah. Kelly Link, myself, right there are three huge fan bases. Yeah. You know, and you've got, like... 24 other authors, each with their own fan base, that are going to show up. And not for nothing, Chris Golden has a fan base. You know, right. not like nobody knows who he is. Well, exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, but you don't want to tell him that because you want to keep him humble before oh, yeah. this thing starts. Yeah, because that <laughs> works for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, apparently, the fire marshal agreed with me because there were concerns that, uh, you know, the venue was going to be too packed. So then they made it, well, you have to have a ticket to get in. Which is all fine and dandy, except there are already folks en route from Atlanta and Indiana and New Jersey who don't have tickets. So, you know, I set it up. Anybody that, that showed up for me that couldn't get in, the people at the door would tell me I'd go outside and sign books for them. Okay. Luckily, I didn't have to do that. Everybody that came to see me got in. Um, I only got harassed outside. Yeah, both of them. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> both of them. Uh, I only got harassed outside. That was when Joe Hill showed up. I was outside for a smoke break. and. He showed up and bellowed across the parking lot that his girlfriend wanted to kick my ass. And uh, <laughs> it, it turned out I knew his girlfriend. I, I met her at the Asbury Zombie Walk many That's years she ago. Oh, wow. And okay. she, did, she did not want to kick my ass. She was delightful. And it was very nice to see both of them again. Um, it was nice to see everybody. I, I, you know, know? I give you hard time. Just start quoting Rush lyrics out. I'm going to roll away and cry. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I signed for five hours, uh, shared a table with Rio, yours, and Mary San Giovanni. Uh, I did a panel with Joe, Mary, uh, film director Izzy Lee, and, and Bracken McLeod. Okay. Um, whose name I pronounced right, I want to fucking point out. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, to, to top the evening off, Jack Haringa organized a live reading of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which went terribly awry. Um, okay. He had it slated for an hour. Now, I know Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is, is a novelette. It's short, and it looks very slim. Right. But it's very, very dense. Right. Yeah. Um, and the language is archaic, and it probably didn't help that I went first, and I was trying to keep the crowd involved by doing things like walking over to Jack with the book and saying, what's this word? <laughs> and then repeating that word into the microphone. But yeah, it went on for like two hours. Oh, yeah. that's um, not good. And we never finished. Jack made a command decision to just stop before the last chapter. Okay. Got there. Well, you know, so, next time. Now we know. House you know, of Spiders 3. House of Spiders 3 by Nicholas Bichette. That went over much better well, in World well, War. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, then after... Uh -huh. after <laughs> we, we, we've broken code. Yeah. Uh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> well, then after that, we all went out to dinner. You know, it was about 30 authors. We uh, all went wait, out to wait, dinner. Wait, 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 wait. You all went out to dinner? Yes. Now, Dave... Yeah. Coop, <laughs> what? Any time I go out to dinner with a group of authors... What happens, uh, invariably? Well, I, I, I'm going to put a preface in it. Go out with a group that does not include me. Because this, I don't do this. <laughs> no, because I don't do this to him. But I'll tell you what happens. Everybody sticks Brian with the bill. That's what happens. That's what happens. The yeah. guy whose math skills... Nicholas Pichon could add, subtract, and multiply <laughs> yeah. circles around me. That's yeah. how bad my math skills yeah. are. Invariably, I'm the one that gets stuck figuring out the fucking bill. Right. Well, what do you think happened? You end up paying. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, you get stuck with it. No, bill. I didn't end up paying. But, oh, okay. Okay, it, you got this large table. There's like 30 authors. There's Sarah Langan and Paul Tremblay and Chris and Jack and just everybody. John Langan. Um, so it's... Paul Tremblay is to my left. Mary San Giovanni's to my right. Directly across from me are Joe Hill, his girlfriend, and Mike Cole. 
who I met for the first time this weekend. Great guy. Um, We're in the center, okay? When the waitress brings the bill, she drops it right down the table between me and Joe. And I'm thinking, well, fuck, of course she did, right? So, uh, you know, Joe pulls out his credit card to pay for him and his girlfriend. And uh, Mallory O'Mara, who I guess she's... Mike's partner, I'm not sure. I'm sorry if I get it wrong. She pulls out her card to pay for theirs. Tremblay pulls out cash to pay for him and Sarah Langan and Sarah's family. I pull out cash to pay for me and Mary. And then I get up and I fucking walk. I go to the bathroom. I go outside and have some nicotine. I come back in and I talk to the wait staff. Um, I shit you not. A book dealer showed up because Golden told me they'd be showing up in the parking lot, and I signed, flat signed some okay. books for them real yeah. quick. I come back in. The bill is still fucking sitting there. Right. Yeah. No one else has even looked at it. Yeah. So now Chris is con tired. He's been organizing all day. He's brain dead. You know, point. Chris yeah. is good people. Normally, he would have no, stepped up. Right. But, you know, it's, it's still fucking sitting there. Oh, my God damn it. I have to do math. So... I take Joe's credit card and I take Mallory's credit card and I sit them by me because I don't want to start passing this thing around with their credit cards in there. And Joe panics. He's like, hey, hey, what are you doing, Keen? I'm like, well, if you want, I'll give everybody a credit card. No, okay, good thinking. (laughs) So, uh, you know, um, I start passing it around. And, you know, everybody can't believe they put it all on one bill and then it turns out oh well maybe they didn't put it on one bill because there's a now there's a second bill floating around it took an hour to get oh, out of now. Oh, um, oh, I'm a mark right now <laughs> but I, I'm happy to say I, I I was with professionals and I unlike previous outings Dave yeah. I did not have to end up throwing in extra cash to make up for well, everything. thank God for that um, because uh, I'm not going to name names, although I should, but I won't. Well, about... Fuck it, you can name no, names. No, 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 no. I, there was a time that we went out to eat, and uh, in Baltimore. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Mary San Giovanni's birthday. Yes, yes. I remember that. Yes, and and some people there felt that you know we're just going to make Brian pay for it. Yeah, Brian. Brian's a best-selling writer. He yeah. can afford it. He can afford it. Yeah. Coop more coffee? No, I'm good. I'm good. good. I'm okay. good for right now. So, so no, that did not happen in, this in time. In this official, in this official. Because I don't know if you remember, like White Castle we Long. went into that restaurant and there was like 30 people. Yeah. And there was a big long table, and right away, me and Phoebe went over and sat at another table because I said, "I'm not getting stuck in this drama." Right. <laughs> and I did. Right. I remember it, that. It was me and Phoebe, and then Bob and Kelly sat with us, and and because I, I said that's going to be a disaster. That there. particular oh, outing, yeah. that particular yeah. outing, I paid for my oldest son, David, right. Mary's son, Mary, and myself. Right. Uh, our bill was around $70. Yeah. I ended up spending about $400 in cash yeah. for yeah. that meal. Because everybody else just is like, yeah. fuck this shit. Yeah. Which, to we'll this let Brian day, pay for it. Yeah, I, my, my head still explodes. Yeah. It is bullshit. And, and I want to stress, yeah. uh, our friends did not do that to me Saturday night. Right. However, they did make me do math. Yes. And as Coop can attest, um, my skills... He knows more about engineering. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but you know what? It was was good. Paul was funny. At at dinner, uh, Paul had like a million questions about you, Dave. Paul Tremblay. I find this fascinating. Well, he is is fascinating with you. I don't think I'm this... Okay, I have have to know what he wanted to know. And then what you said, because it was probably wrong. So, well... (laughs) Yeah, no, there's a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he uh, he said that he likes you because Coop's looking at engineering equipment on the table. Those okay. are for my Fitbit. You plug those into the computer, and then uh, I plug my Fitbit into it, and it tells how many steps I've taken today versus how many steps Valerie Botchlet <laughs> and my ex-wife and everybody else, Scott Edelman, have taken. Now, you can make fun of me, but you cannot make fun to. of Scott Edelman. <laughs> Uh, no, I will make fun of you. <laughs> go ahead. Nothing. I'm no. Just okay. You, you go do right. your, yeah. go so, do your um, thing. No, Paul, he, he mentioned that he, he really likes you, which I always enjoy hearing because you, you're you convinced that no one likes you. Um, and when they always tell well, me they like your, you, you're never around. That's kind of Dave's branding. It is. <laughs> but he, he wanted to know how we met. And, you know, what you used to do in the music industry and, you know, 
were you okay? He knew that you couldn't come because, you know, you had to go to the doctor. He just, he, he genuinely appreciates and likes you and thinks no, you're no, a funny that's, guy. That's cool. I, I was just curious what he was asking about because, I, I you know, you, you guys know me really well, but honestly, most like I tell you, most people, the, the, you really don't know about pretty much the first 40 years of my well, life. No, I told him, you know, <laughs> so, he wanted I, to know yeah, how we met. I told him yeah. about the porno shoot, you know, <laughs> we met on the set of that. Yes. Um, you know, <laughs> it was the same one Wes Craven was working yeah. on back then. <laughs> um, that alpaca is still in therapy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, um, he did tell me he's, right now, he's doing the final edits on another horror novel. Oh, uh, cool. Follow up to Head Full of Ghosts. That's awesome. Not, not a sequel. I don't right, no, but it's his next book. But yeah. it's the same vein. Yeah. Um, I, I got all kinds of gossip. Well, let's let's hear it. Uh, Joe Hill was ter- telling me about his next novel, The Fireman. Apparently, it it is a door motherfucking doorstop of a novel. Really? Um, because uh, Nosferatu is pretty big. Nos- too. He said, yeah. "I the way he talked, it sounds like this will be bigger than Nosferatu." Wow, that's a he's big. He's not part. sure yet. You know, he's still. He said like he cut some stuff out, but then he decided he needed it in there. Um, what else? Mary San Giovanni, we're allowed to announce she signed a two book deal with Kensington. Excellent. So, you know, that's very cool. More proof that, that horror is on its way back on the Does shelves. she not have a new book out or coming out? She or? has a new book uh, came out this week from yeah. Thunderstorm Books called The Blue People. Okay. Yep. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I think uh, that's available for order right now right. from cool. thunderstormbooks.com. Yeah. And Rio Yours has his first mass market novel coming out late next year. Uh, the tentative title is Remember Me, okay. but that might change. Um, apparently, it's, it's uh, like a. A supernatural crime novel so okay. yeah lots of news came away with but it was a good weekend no i i i'm so. i'm sad i couldn't go i will freely admit i'm not sad that i missed 13 hours in the car because <laughs> oh it was brutal well, otherwise that's usually known as connecticut but right, right. <laughs> and right. You, you know i'm not supposed to be driving after dark yeah no, by the way it is i yeah. i literally was you know, I was like Snake Plissken or Laird Barron by the end. I was literally driving one right. hand on the wheel yeah. and one hand over my eye oh, for man. like the last hour of the drive. Mm. Coop, how was your weekend? Well, um, I worked this past weekend. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I protected the hell out of the couch at the uh, 88 station in Norfolk County. <laughs> that means there um, weren't a lot of calls? Well, for at the station that I'm currently at for this month, um, it's... Yeah, it, it's a lower call volume than than other ones, but uh, no, we. I mean, the first day was fairly slow, and then the next couple of days we were, you know, for that station, you know, remarkably busy. Yeah. Still nowhere near, you know, the volume that I used to run in uh, in the city there. Yeah. But uh, so did that. Um, I did get announcement from uh, MGRA, the Maryland Delaware Rocketry Association, that the October launch is going to be this upcoming weekend. Really? Yeah. So I get to go to. I haven't been. I haven't been able to launch since April because all of the summer launches have been on weekends that I've been working. Right. With the new gig, I have not had the time off. You know, I haven't been able to accrue the time off or had the seniority to say, you know, here I'm doing this. When I was working in town, when I was working in the city, it was no problem. It was, yeah, you know, I had I had some little more uh, leverage there. But uh, so I haven't been able to go since April. Um, are so you? I'm going to take the kids down. We'll probably just do a day trip. Are you going to take the Hellraiser? No. Well, I'll take it down uh, so it can be, you know, so the guys that are on my uh, advisory committee can, you know, check it out and everything. You yeah. know, for next month's launch, well, I'm hoping it's going to be next month that I'll be able to get that up. So I'll be able to get that inspected. I may throw up a couple of the level ones that uh, the uh, the space arc that I did. Yeah. It, from the uh, from the old, from the old movie uh, One Worlds Collide, right? You know, I made a scale model of that from uh, Pemberton Tech. For for listeners that have in their mind, you know, they're picturing you <laughs> with like a a small maybe twelve inch model rocket. Describe the Hellraiser's proportions. <laughs> well, um, if you're friends with me on Facebook, you can you can check that out. Um, I have the whole build thread. It's you know, it, it's damn near 300 pictures in the in the overall threat, but uh, Hellraiser's dimensions it is about seven and three quarter inch diameter. Um, and how tall? Ten foot, ten foot seven. 
10 feet 7 inches tall. This is not your mom and dad's <laughs> No, this is rocket. not this is not an Estes rocket by yeah. any stretch of the imagination. Um and what does it take to launch that? What you, like uh, I mean like ammonium perchlorate? <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. I, I use aluminum as fuel with ammonium perchlorate oxidizer and um the, the thrust required for this, you know, the engine that I'm going to be using, or the motor, it's not an engine. It doesn't have any moving parts. But the motor that I'm going to be using, you know, everybody's familiar with the, you know, Estes rockets, or most people are. Right. If they're familiar with, you know, hobby rocketry at all. They're thick in Estes, where you have, like, these little things where you have your A's, B's, and C's They look engines. like a firework. C is usually about the biggest that you can launch at your, you know, uh, high school, you know, athletics field and, you know, stuff like that. Maybe if you have a larger model rocket, you can use a D. And uh, that's generally the biggest uh, motor that people will be familiar with. Hellraiser, when that thing launches, the motor that I'll be using in it is 352.7 of the D of the SDS D12s. Holy shit! <laughs> Um, it, it's it's not small. Are that, you on like a government weird. watch list for buying this? Yeah, I should put that as like one of the frequently asked fucking questions. No, I'm not on the government watch list for this. I may be on for this. For this. this. I may be on a government watch list for working for Jihad Publications. Oh, back in the day, yeah. <laughs> but, but you know that that was um, you know. When we still had a World Trade Center before a bunch of motherfuckers were murdered right. in, the, in the city. But, uh, no, I'm not on a government watch list for this. I, uh, you know, I am complying with government regulations, much to, you know, some people's chagrin that, you know, want to see this th thing launched that aren't going to be able to come down. Um, you know, we comply with the, F uh, the FAA and uh, actually the FCC. Yeah? Yeah, you know, well, I have to have a... Uh, a ham license right. to do, I do telemetry from it. So I'll be able to get live data in flight while this thing is going. To do that, I use a 70 centimeter, I use the 70 centimeter band and, you know, to use that band, you have to have the FCC license. How high, how high can the Hellraiser go? Like when you eventually launch it, and I'm going to be there that fucking day, we're going to, yeah, in fact, gotta, I, I think we should record it for the fucking show. Uh, I, you know, that would be awesome. How high will that thing get? Potentially. Um, my my simulations for this launch, you know, for all the work that I did, I'm expecting an apogee of somewhere between 6,500 and 7,000 feet. Wow. Um, as far as it can go, how high it can get, it could go, if money were no object, and you know, more people bought uh, commercials on on here, <laughs> then uh, probably 15, 16,000 feet. Holy shit. You know, if I can, you know, cut the check for the motor and all that. Well, there you go, probably, folks. Probably 15,000, 16,000 feet. But, I mean, the motors for this aren't cheap. You know, the motor that I'm using is, uh, it's about 300 bucks for that motor. If you would like to, and I, I'm being completely serious, if you would like to sponsor Coop's launch of the Hellraiser and get him a bigger motor, bigger engine, uh, contact Jess, J-E-S-S, -S, at projectiradio.com. And uh, we will work something out for you. That would that would be really that would be really really cool. It would. I know a lot of people do like you know crowdsourcing for this and that and the other damn thing. Yeah, you know? White Castle. Yeah. you know you send us mugs yeah. and swag. You know, it's like your uh, local on the side. You know, of the I, I would be or or like this delicious Fiji water I'm opening right now. That <laughs> I, I open every week and they still not send me any. No, they have not. <laughs> No, but I mean, I know a lot of people do crowdsourcing and stuff like that, and and you know, I'm I, I won't set up you know crowdsourcing for me to pursue you know my heart. Right. That's that's not anything that I'm about. However, that said. Oh, look at that! The meth head's got a car. Wasn't that nice? Well, that's that's what the world needs. Is, is Why not? You more... have a car. You're no more dangerous behind the wheel than he is. <laughs> yeah. Well, there. there. But I mean, if. Uh, you know, if enough people are, you know, would be interested and, you know, want to be part of a launch from this thing, you know, I think that we could probably work something out between, cool. you know, the horror show and Project I Radio and, you know, organize, you know, have like a sponsored launch. You know, I'd be, I'd be happy to do that. I All think right. That'd be fun. Well, there we go. You know, uh -oh. if you want me to build something for you, now we're going to be talking some serious things. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now you, uh. 
I think you had some other news this weekend, Coop. Did you or did you not have a new book come out? Well, I had a re-release of an old book, so I guess that counts. Yeah, no, that's something that happened this weekend. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks to uh, Jeff Burke and Dead Eye Press, uh, which is uh, you know, part of Eraserhead. I'm, they are going to be re-releasing my collection, Answers of Silence, which was released in 2012? 2013, that, yeah, it came out. No, you're right. It was the 2012 edition of Maelstrom. Yeah, I think it was. My, my yeah. imprint through Thunderstorm. Yeah, so it yep. was uh, through Thunderstorm, then Maelstrom imprint there. And uh, that being is the Maelstrom is uh, such a limited run. And not only limited, but, uh, you know, you have to buy the three books. I mean, and, right. and they're not cheap. I mean, and, you know, not. I don't think that many people got to read it or maybe have been aware of it. Uh, Jeff Burke decided that he was going to unfuck this and oh, yes, he did. make this a uh, you know a trade paperback for a reasonable price and uh, something called an ebook, right. which I'm aware exists. <laughs> uh, he was kind enough during the editorial process to send me copies of the ebook files, right? And I goofily tried to click on them to open it to see what they were. I had no, it, it, you know, file, like there was a file association error. Like I couldn't yeah. click into the damn thing. But uh, I was informed that uh, the one file extension was for a Nook and the other, other file extension was for a Kindle. Yep. Apparently they use different uh, file sources or whatever to generate the ebook on the their respective readers. Right. Um, what What's it like for you? I mean, I know you don't. You you do not promote, you know. Um, I know writing has, and well, perhaps more accurately, publishing has never been an easy process for you. Uh, is it nerve wracking for a release like this to come out and suddenly everybody's looking at you and they want to talk about answers of silence and what are you working on next? And I mean, uh, in, in in many ways, yes. In many ways, it is sort of nerve-wracking. In many ways, it's like coming home, which is nerve-wracking. Yeah. Um, I think to really go into into that in, in any detail, you know, we still have we still have yeah, a, I'm a lot of time to listen to today. And look, I, I mean, I, I can mean, spend hours just on that subject. Yeah. For the record, I'm not putting you on the spot. No, 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 no. And if I thought you were, I would have you know told you to fuck off by it. Well, this is true. <laughs> um, Publishing, the, you know, I'm I'm glad the book is out there, and you know, and I hope people read it, and I hope people like it, you know, and you know, there there is always that, yeah, and that to me is not really nerve wracking, no, because it's it, it's there, it's there, like it or not, whether I'm happy with it or not, you know, whether I am enamored with the idea or not, it's there, and it's out. You know, it, it's currently out now. So if you have one of those, uh, you know, ebook things and would like to get it for, I think, four ninety five for the ebook and I think it's four ninety five. Yeah. Yeah, twelve, well, almost thirteen bucks for the paperback. Thirteen and six. We'll just go with those numbers. Um, if you've got, uh, you know, if you've got that floating around and you know want to buy it, you know, great. Right. You know, I, I, I am all for that. I'm all for that. You know, if you choose to spend, you know, your money on me. That is awesome, and I appreciate it. I really, truly do. Well, I, you know, I don't want people to think that uh, you know that I'm not appreciative of the fans and the people that read it because I mean that's that's the whole point. You know, where I, writing for me is like I, I don't I don't want to do it. Well, I, I don't want to do it. I know, and. For me to get into get into that, we're we're going to need a lot more time than we're allotted. All right. Well, <laughs> we'll do that another time. I think it's great that both you and Bell Wilson both have yeah new yeah, books no, out that's, this year. Yeah, that's um, the other thing that I learned this weekend that you know Bell's got a new book coming out. Yeah. That is fucking awesome. Yeah. And if it comes a choice between you know spending you know thirteen dollars on me or you know thirteen dollars on Bell, give it to Bell. Give it to Bell. That's yeah. a fucking movie. You're, you're not going to be disappointed there. Well, I, you know, 
I think uh, Dangerous Red and your last book, Retribution Inc., I, I think they came out the same year, did they not? Yeah. We, so it's been yeah, a while for you yeah, both. Yeah, there's so, a weird... That's kind of, yeah, that is kind of weird, but yeah, I think you're right. They did yeah. come out about the same time. Well, I will say, I first of all, I agree with Coop. Um, if you have not yet read Belle Wilson, and we've talked about her in, in many past episodes, but yeah, uh, definitely you need to check her out. And as far as Coop's book, Answers of Silence... Um, I mean, you know, Coop's one of my best friends. Coop could, could shoot up a school bus and he'd still be one of my best friends. I, I would hate his guts for doing that, but you know, I'd still care about the motherfucker. Um, <laughs> but he's also one of my favorite writers and he always has been. And, uh, I know working on that collection for myself, uh, it's one of the, it's one of the touchstones of my career. And I know that Jesus felt the same way. Um, when we finally had that thing together, Jesus said, quote, unquote, we did good. And I said, well, Coop did good. We just kind of collected it all together and twisted his arm and said, we're publishing this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's but, what uh, I was saying. I mean, to get know, into the whole thing about that book and how it came to be, yeah, that could. That could <laughs> right. We'll, we'll, do that. we'll do that on another show. Um, all right. Well, before we get to Paul and Tom and... Uh, before we get to the head full of ghost spoiler discussion, two quick news items. Uh, Dave got a phone. Well, hopefully. <laughs> and, and we mentioned that, you know, that's that's about as likely as Clive Barker releasing an, a new short story collection. Well, guess what, guys? Clive Barker's releasing a new short story collection. Okay. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been 25 years yeah. since Books of Blood. Mm-hmm. Um, the new one is called Tonight Again. Um, now, this is not a collection of horror stories. It's a collection of erotica. The vast majority of it has been unpublished, um, and that's coming out from Subterranean Press. Apparently, it's already at the printer. Uh, that's really all the information we have on it, but I thought it'd be worth mentioning. Oh, hell yeah. Um, hell yeah. Anything my collection is worth mentioning. Yeah, I know Scarlet Gospels, uh, a lot of readers were disappointed with it, I think is a fair way to say. That's you know, I don't the views know. I read were not yeah. kind. I have not read the book. I don't so. know when the material in this book was written. The way the, the description reads, it, it sounds like it's been over the last 25 years. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. Uh, the other news, it's another quick news item. Uh, Chris Alexander has stepped down as editor of Fangoria Magazine. Uh, longtime staff writer Michael Gingold will be replacing him. Uh, anybody who still reads Fangoria, and I'm one of them, I, I still read Fangoria and Rue Morgue every month. Uh, you know, Michael, has, he's, a, he's a really good critic. Uh, he's written some really insightful movie stuff, and uh, I think he's going to do a fine job. Do you guys still read Fangoria? I pretty much, I don't really read any magazines anymore. No? Yeah. I've, I've kind of just drifted away from the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, occasionally, we'll still pick up like a music technology magazine or something, but uh, for the longest time, I had a subscription to Wired, and even that I kind of gave up on. Yeah. It's just easier to go online and read stuff. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I still get, uh, every month I get Rue Morgue, Fangoria, Soldier of Fortune, and National Geographic. Okay. So th- those are my four on the toilet reads. <laughs> right. <laughs> I had no idea that Soldier of Fortune was still being printed. Oh, yeah. I, oh, I really yeah. did not know that. Yeah, 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 it's hard to find at, like, grocery stores and shit, yeah. but, yeah, I got a subscription. I, so. I can see why it would be hard to find at the grocery store. But, you know, yeah. here, here's the thing. People, they hear of Soldier of Fortune, and they think it's probably all, like, you know, right-wing propaganda or gun articles, but it's not. There's some really good political analysis. The best examination of ISIS and how they formed and how they've gotten to be so strong that I've read. It wasn't in Newsweek. It wasn't Time Magazine. It wasn't The Guardian or Drudge Report. It was in Soldier of Fortune. That's funny because there was an article in The Atlantic about that same topic, yeah. which I thought was the best analysis. I have not read The Soldier of Fortune. Do you just right. happen to have that issue? Uh, I, I may know. have it somewhere. Because I seriously office. would like to borrow that yeah. and read it. Um, no, I know that it's more than just... Uh, you know, I shot 15 terrorists in my yeah, backyard. I mean, you know, there's thing. gun porn, too. Yeah, Don't get well, me wrong. Duh, but, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Weston Oaks is actually freelanced for Soldier of Fortune, our, our buddy Weston. So I, yeah, I can see why that would happen. Yeah, <laughs> I, I actually uh, opened it. <laughs> issue came in the mail, and I opened up, and there's an article by Weston on the mass <laughs> I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but, uh, you would know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's go to our interview with F. Paul Wilson and Thomas Monteleone. Now, remember, when we come back from that, 
we're going to do a spoiler discussion about Paul Tremblay's A Head Full of Ghosts. Uh, but you're still safe right now. You can still listen. Um, as Dave said, this is definitely one of the best interviews. Before we before we listen to it, I just I want to set the stage. Um, this is recorded in a hotel room at Scares the Care. Dave and I are sitting on one bed. Paul and Tom are sitting on another bed. Each of us are holding a microphone. John Urbansick is in the background mm-hmm. making everybody drinks. Um, basically, we let Paul and Tom drink some Knob Creek for about 20 minutes, let them loosen up and relax, and then we just kind of hit record. And, uh, you know, as I told them, we didn't want to talk about Repairman Jack or about Blood of the Lamb or about any of that. What we wanted to talk about was how they met, their friendship, what this industry has at times done to their friendship, how they've persevered over that, where they're at now. Um, it's incredibly insightful. It's stuff you've never heard either one of them talk about in public. And uh, there, I mean, I know these guys very well. There, I, I was surprised. There were some things I never knew about that, right. that come up in this. No, this, this is a so, fascinating conversation. Yeah. So, all right, we'll go to that. And we'll see you on the flip side. Okay, Dave, our next two guests need no introduction. Do you think they need an introduction? I I don't think so. I don't think so either, but I'm going to anyway. Both (laughs) of them are best-selling, award-winning writers. Both of them have been writing professionally for, I think, five decades now. Both of them have written countless novels and short stories, as well as nonfiction, comic books, screenplays, and more. If you haven't guessed who yet, let me give you another hint. One of them created the hugely popular Repairman Jack. Another may have been ripped off by the Da Vinci Code. (laughs) Uh, To several, several generations of writers. They are veterans, legends, mentors, and friends. They are also, in my personal opinion, the most exciting, anticipated guests we've had on the show yet. And and I I don't mean to put this out, but this is a, a true thing. The first time we've had someone on the show older than me. Well, you guys really know how to make a <laughs> We are going there already. Thank you so much. Folks, we are, of course, talking about F. Paul Wilson and Thomas Monteleone. <laughs> Yay! So we know where this interview is. So we <laughs> know where this interview is going. Have you listened to the show? <laughs> <laughs> now, a, nah. pre- a precursor to this interview, um, I want the listening audience to understand something going in. There are thousands of interviews with Paul and Tom. Um, if you want to read those interviews, there's this fucking thing called Google. Yeah. You know, you can use it. <laughs> when we set this up, I told them I didn't want to ask Paul for the 500th time when the Repairman Jack movie's coming out or ask Tom for the 500th time about the horrors of writing for television. Instead, I wanted to focus on something else. Um, I first had this idea about two years ago. Uh, J.F. Gonzalez, Mary San Giovanni, and I were at a used bookstore, and we came across an old issue of Mystery Scene magazine. I guess it was like the early 80s. And inside was a picture of Tom and another picture, excuse me, of Paul. And both of them were wearing suits that looked like something Herb Tarlick on WKRP would wear. (laughs) And, you know, the three of us just talked about how cool it would have been to be a fly on the wall back then when these guys were coming up. And, you know, how fucking awesome that would have been. So um, what we want to talk about, instead of the questions you guys usually get, is your friendship and and what that's been like over the years you know how you met how you've supported each other were there times it got tough because we all all of us in this room know what this business can do to friendships as well as any other relationship but it has also the ability to forge friendships that would never be any better i agree Absolutely. because of what we understand about what we do yep How's Tom's levels there? He's talk a little bit louder. A little okay. bit louder. Yeah. Okay. I can definitely that's never a problem I, I for Tom. I, I, that's problem. what I figured. <laughs> I like how you take direction. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you guys both started writing professionally in the early 70s. Tom, yeah. uh, your first novel, Seeds of Change, came out in 75. And Paul, your first novel, Healer, came out a year later in 76. Before that, you both had short fiction appearing in sci-fi mags. When did you first become aware of each other? Was it... I think it was the SFW used to run these editor-author um, receptions in New York City every fall, the, the Monday after PhilCon, because PhilCon would bring a lot of writers into the East Coast, the Northeast, and then they would, Monday night, they'd, I was in charge of it for years as Eastern Regional Director of SFWA, and um, we would run into each other, and 
we you know we would have a, a nodding acquaintance and you know hi how you doing and stuff like that we never I don't think it was until Nikon that we actually became it's very tight we, we started but see you don't remember that I met you at Disclave oh yeah back. that's what we really school. met that was the first meeting yeah tell them about that yes we both had our these name tags on it was a it was a uh, meet the author party it was all sci-fi people right and I think neither one of us had sold anything. A couple, a couple short stories, right? No, and that, that was. Um, the, oh, well, your book was coming out. That was the introduction of the paperback of Healer. That's right. That's right. That's right. But you had already had, had Seeds a, of Change. I had, I had Seeds of Change out, and they, they gave everybody a little straw hat or something to wear, remember, or a yeah. badge, and so they could, could tell you if you were a writer or not. Right. And it was a meet the writers thing. And I'm walking around. He's, I, I nobody knew who I was. I was like. Rick Hoddle is turned in a punch bowl. <laughs> you know, you know, nobody's looking at you. Nobody's talking to you. You're standing there, right? So I walked up to him. He was standing there with Steve Sproul. I think you were with Steve. Mm-hmm. And and I walked up to him and I said, what's the F stand for? You know, on his badge. Right. And he goes, Francis. <laughs> I didn't want to admit it because Francis was a talking mule. Back, right. Yeah. So he says, what about yours? And I said, Francis. <laughs> And we got a big kick out of it. That, and that was it. Yeah, and, I, and I'm thinking, wow, our parents both effed us, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's how we met. That's how we met. And then we would see each other at the yeah, ship, ship, ship Ships in the Night, but it was Nikon yep. where we got together. And I, and I remember you coming up to me at, at a Nikon and just saying how much you like Black Wind. Mm. So it would have to be like 88. God, how and long ago is that now? Already? 88. 80, yeah. and, it was, and we it were, was 1988 a long ago, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and we started talking, and then we started traveling to Nikon together. You know, Doug Winter, uh, Lynn Winter. I don't know if you had Elizabeth yet. Elizabeth right? was like 91 or 91. Okay, so Elizabeth wasn't yet. But like the four of us would, would, would drive to Nikon to get together. They would stay over my house. On, on Thursday night, yeah. I'd drive up on Friday, and I would cook out and, and stuff like that. But then we really started bonding, right. and um, really Doug, Doug, Tom, and I are, are like you know we we become like three musketeers. Yeah. But Tom and I are even closer because we realize we, we lived the same life. Yes. <laughs> it was we would talk about our childhoods, and it was, it was just eerie. like you're kidding me. <laughs> yeah. I said, did you ever have a chemistry set? I had a Gilbert. He said, like, oh, I had a Gilbert, too. So I find an old picture of me right. with my Gilbert chemistry. He has one exactly like it. I <laughs> said, so did, did you ever almost burn down your house? Yes. Yeah. So I almost like, yeah. 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 It's just, we, we watched the same movies. Yeah. We, it was just one of these Reading things. Reading the same it, books. Yes, same books. Mm-hmm. And at almost the same year, we would read the same books. Yeah. And it was, it's, it's like, you know, it got to be after a while, you know, we started spending time together and we started finishing each other's thoughts. It was, it was, <laughs> we knew what we were going to say before you were talking. It's like, I, man, I, I needed this. Where were you all my life? I mean, I, this is a brother I never had. Oh, I get it. I mean, you know, uh, you know what I mean? Jesus and I, we were, we were like that. Oh my you know? God, I get it. We just had, and some of the stuff that we would remember, and he would say. Oh yeah, that was the time that John Agar said, hmm. and you know, it's like, <laughs> who else would know that? <laughs> right? Well, you know, you guys mentioned Nikon and going up to Nikon together. I, I had I had noted here, you know, writers have always formed literary circles or tribes. You know, there's the Lovecraft circle of the Weird Tales era. There's the California Sorcerers, the Splatter Punks. Um, you know, John Urbansick is lurking in the background, getting our drinks. He, you, of course, know we had our own little circle. Um, I guess there there was such a thing really as the Nikon circle. I mean, the two of you and Douglas Winter and Chet Williamson. Yeah. You know, Craig, uh, and you know, it didn't happen. And Craig Shaw Gardner. Craig Shaw Gardner. Yeah. And, but it didn't yeah. happen by design. That was the weird thing. It just kind of. I don't think happened. they ever do really. Do I don't they? think so. No. No. You know, it's it's like-minded people banding together at a certain time. So. And that convention, and for people who are listening and don't know anything about it, it is. It's it's not the usual convention. It's it's like a family reunion. Oh yeah. Something. Well, we we've talked with picnics uh, and you know it's uh, crazy. Soggies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When we uh, when we had Mary San Giovanni on, uh, we spent what Dave a good twenty minutes. Yeah, I, on, I, I on basically Nikon. had her talk about because I know that she 
has been there more than either you or I right. had. Mm-hmm. So I kind of wanted people listening because <laughs> we had been talking on air that we were going to go this year. Right. And um, I wanted her to explain it from a person who's been there I think 12 a, times. Or, a person who's yeah, become a Nikon, Nikon legend yeah. alongside the two of you. Yeah. Which she was just blown away by, you know. <laughs> um, so, I mean, now, this doesn't so much have to do with your friendship, but it's just, it's a great fucking story. And I don't know, Paul, you may have been there, but, but Tom, you've got so many great stories. One of my favorites by you is the one about Agent Kirby McCauley's party after they sold the rights to Stephen King's The Shining. Now, we we don't have to tell that story to the audience if you don't want oh, to. Do you want to go on record with that? That was like the debauchery the question a third is, exponent. The question is, do you, do you want to go on record? I won't make you go on record, but I would like to know if Paul was there that night. No, I wasn't. No, yeah, he wasn't I wasn't there. with with Kirby. I my was, agent yeah. was Al Zuckerman, who's one of the you know the grand old men of of uh, New York literary agents. Right. And, uh, so going strong. Oh yeah, he's yeah. 85 years old and he's still. Can you, you know, believe this? Wow. wow, that's amazing. He's still going. <laughs> wow. He's still hustling. He's, well, he, he he's not really taking many new clients, but he's got all his marbles and he's editing. You know, I mean, all of Ken Follett's novels. You know, he and Ken Follett almost collaborate on. Them. Right. And um, he's still as sharp as can be. Wow. But you know, it, people always hate me because they say, "Oh, I'm having such trouble getting an agent." I said, "Well, my agent." Yeah, called me because <laughs> <laughs> Al had been sell, selling the foreign rights to my science fiction novels for Doubleday, and he called me up and he said, you know, he said, he said, you know, I like I like the way you sustain a narrative. He said, I, do you have an agent? I said, no. He said, I'd like to represent you, and and so you know, I went in and met with him. We got off, uh, you know, to get we got on together, and it's that was 1977. So wow, wow. Yeah, but no. you know why he's still doing it? It's because he loves what he's doing. Oh, yeah. He loves what he's and doing. And he's good at it. I mean, if you're doing something you love, you're not going to want to stop. Oh, agreed. You know? Agreed. If, if, I, all, if I didn't love this job, I'd be back to driving tractor trailer yeah. tomorrow, you know? I mean, look at these guys. I always look at the the all the, the famous composers and, and conductors. They're all old bastards. They're old crazy bastards. But they're all still conducting orchestras into their 80s. Right. Like, because that's their life. That's what they live for. Yep. But let's just go back. I mean, the one thing about this, the writing career, is showing up year after mm-hmm. year after year. I mean, we know so many writers, and they weren't bad writers. Some of them were very good writers. But the thing is, where are they now? They couldn't keep it. They're right. not there. And the thing is, Tom and I kept showing up. You kept coming to the party. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's what you do. Yeah. And and that's what you know. That's going to sustain a career. That's what it takes. And the thing is, if you finally say, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, okay, that's fine. The, you know, the publishing, nobody's going to make the you. publishing no. community is not going to miss you. No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and there are other writers waiting in the wings. Oh, no, they're to take ready to step into that spot. Mm-hmm. And I re- I look at all the I, I go back through some of the anthologies that I've been in, and I look at the, all the names, and they were all like. They were players at the time. Yeah. And you haven't heard if I if I named them, you know, most of most of the people who were listening, if I say Gordon Eckland, you know, Gordon Eckland and I shared binary stores too. I gotta be honest, that's a, that's a yeah. name I don't know. Again, but he, he was a major he was, name in science fiction. He was a player. Yeah. He was a player at that time in oh, the seventies. Yeah. Um but Greg he, Greg he, Bear. He, There's he, a lot of them. Greg Bear's out there still. Yeah, Greg Bear he is still. still there. He's doing, you know, Halo novels and stuff like that. Oh well, that's okay. But he's you yeah, know, but he's still working. Yeah. yeah, he's still working. Oh, great. Yeah, Greg's. You know, but yeah, you know, Orson. Orson was Orson Scott Card was. You know, he was just, you know, just a guy like you know Tom and Tom and I. But you know, the thing is, he Tom and me, I should say, because <laughs> I go to the boot camp. Um, <laughs> um, you know, he was he was a struggler and a, and a toiler, and then you know he hit, um, you know the. Uh, Ender's Game. Ender's Game, and it, worked um, for him. Right. it went on forever. So, I mean, but the thing is, you know, he hung in there, and, and that's that's the whole thing. Showing up, you may not show up with the best material that everybody wants, but the thing is, you're there. And then you keep going on, and you get better, and you get better, and you get better. Uh, but it's showing up. It's not giving up. And, and that's that's, God, what, remember that's the two guys. of us. We, I mean, we, we just... 
We you kept plugging. Stop. You don't stop. I mean, I've had ups and downs. You know, the, when the horror crashed in, in the early 90s, I mean, I I was looking at huge returns on, on, on my books. That's that's one of the questions I had for you okay. guys. Well, you it's know like what? You know just, what? No, go ahead. You, you know what was really bad? I mean, I had Kirby McCauley's an agent. He was great. I really miss him, and he, he was very smart in a lot of ways. But he said that when we were, we were all starting – Back when King was selling everything, you could sell a paperback horror novel, you know, and sell. It was not unusual to sell eighty, hundred thousand copies. I was right. buying of every the one average of them. Yeah. horror novel. I was buying every one of them and I could Kirby find. And Kirby says then. to Charlie and I, says, "The future of publishing is paperback originals." Remember, remember mm-hmm. and, then everybody, and everybody was doing them. And every you for tour and and uh, who was the other one? Pocket Fawcett. They were Berkeley. Berkeley. They were cranking out horror novels like crazy and if you could keep writing and you were serious about it right you're gonna make a lot of sales oh yeah and and we were the problem you know what the problem was what was the problem you never paperback novels never got reviewed and back in that time in the 80s and 90s the newspaper reviews still meant something but they only reviewed hardcovers yeah so you're writing all these paperbacks that are selling but they sell for three months, four months, they're on the shelf, and then goodbye. And then you never get reviewed. You never get that recognition of being a legitimate writer. You're a paperback writer. Right. And then all of a sudden, when the bottom fell out of the paperback market, you couldn't sell a hardcover because you hadn't sold one. Right. So you had to convince people to... Yeah, if someone looks through Publishers Weekly for reviews of your book... And they're not there. They're not there. They're not there. Mm. Well, and there was something to be said for be- prolific paperback writers. I mean, William W. Johnstone was, was not a great wordsmith, and I go back and they reread his stuff. Kind of story. Yeah, I go back and awesome. reread his stuff now, and it's like, what the hell was I reading? But <laughs> back then, I bought one every four months because he had a new one out every four months well you yeah know? that was crazy and i bought everything yeah but yeah you know? the, those are the exceptions yeah, yeah don, don pendleton and right. yeah those, the, the oh my god remember series? that yeah pendleton was just like you know. incredible but but then i told kirby says to me he says well you're gonna have to in order to break into heart you have to come up with a high concept this is what he tells me <laughs> oh 10 years later thank you <laughs> yeah, now now you're telling me what i just gotta do remember that that was the high concept that was the, the well you know that's you're looking for that. that's what you know when when you know, be born a reprisal and night world well reborn a reprisal they shipped huge numbers right and they had huge returns Right. In paperback. Yeah. Yeah. They were paperback originals. What did that do to your career? That number of returns. I, you know, I was, you know, I remember walking along the boardwalk with my wife, you know, in like ninety two, ninety one, and I'm saying, you know, I think I got to do something different. I think this is over. Wow. wow. Uh-huh. Were you thinking of leaving writing or just no, not leaving writing? Yeah, but I'm saying, I, you know, I, I got to, I got to write something different because it's hard. You know, I, I think I wrote some really good stuff. Right. And it's not selling. Um, that was the the next year. Your uh, what was it, Megan, who was going to Loyola College, and you we came you came down to see her, and we went out. You told me that whole story. Yeah. And the and and we were I, in Fell's Point, you know, just right. ripping up Fell's Point. <laughs> <laughs> right, and you had said I had to go through this complete transition. We talked about right. It. And, and I decided. I said I'm going to write a medical thriller. Right. You know. Well, that's where that came from. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, 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 it was called the Ingram, and I wrote it under the name Colin Andrews, because I, I didn't want it going out and people saying, oh, it's another, Paul Wilson horror right. novel. So, I wrote it under the name Colin Andrews, also because they wanted to be on the top shelf, so <laughs> the bottom shelf, because people with bad backs never saw my my titles. <laughs> so. And I got the biggest advance of, of my career. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I, I went into the seven figure club. Wow. Wow. And um, it sold. And my agent, I got to hand it to him. He sold it to Italy first. Yeah. Just before the Frankfurt Book Fair, and they paid. Yeah. You know, he said we just sold it to Italy for forty million lira. I said I'm rich. He said no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but then you know people in Frankfurt were saying oh. Italy pay forty million lira. Let me see it, and it just went bang, 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 one country after another at the Frankfurt Book Fair. But you know, and by the time the, the book fair was over, everybody in America, all the publishers in America, wanted to see it. Right. And so 
it was Berkeley and Putnam and it was um, William Morrow. They were bidding it up all, all into the stratosphere. And um, they changed the name of it, right? And they changed the name. Yeah. And, they, and they also changed the author's name. They said, that, yeah, we want to send you out. I mean, I don't want to go into the whole story of how, you know, William Morrow fell apart, you know, right. as the book was coming out. But the thing was, I had to reinvent myself. And that and that's something you have to be ready to do Absolutely. as a career. And um, I really love and to select. I just did a, a you know I just did a, an online sale on it, and we we just sold thirty five hundred copies in a day. And so it's you know it's still selling, it's still relevant. But the thing is, you got to be willing to to adapt. Right. You have to say, okay, I love horror, so I'm going to write a medical school horror story, but it's going to be called a medical thriller. You know, it's all marketing, right? And that's what people, a lot of people don't see is that I'm always in the horror shelf, but I don't, you know, because of the keep, right? The keep is like, you know, horror. And so he wrote the keep, he's horror. You know, I just wrote a book that nothing horror in it, you know, <laughs> he's going to be horror. You know? So I mean, it's, it's, it's what you have to deal with. But, you know, I, I can go on and on about, you know, you know, self-publishing and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the publishers portray themselves as the arbiters. You know, they're the gatekeepers of quality in literature. But, you know, that's total bullshit. Yeah, it, it, not anymore. I mean, but they get, you got five novels in front of you. They're all of equal quality. Which one are they going to pick? Right. The one they can market the best. That's what... And, and you can have a better novel than that one, but that one's more marketable. So, guess what? You get rejected. Yep. And, and there's a very small uh, s selection of judges now. There's five major publishers. Right. When we broke in, we could... There were we 20. Could, it, we, you could, and, and the other thing that was weird is you could go up to New York and you could walk the streets. You could walk into the publisher's offices and say, Hi, I'm Tom. I'm Paul. How you doing? And, and say, Can I talk to your science fiction editor? And the, the receptionist would say... Oh yeah, that's Adele Leone. Hold on, I'll give her a call. And she come out and talk to you, right? I mean, right. This is not. Well, I never, I never did that. You did that. I used to do it a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, now, let me ask you guys this. this <laughs> it's it's a question for each of you. I want to start with Paul. And it, it, if I step on toes, I apologize in advance. But it dovetails into, into what you're saying. Um, you've both seen all the triumphs and pitfalls that this industry offers. Um, you know, we've talked about it here. You. Both enjoyed numerous successes and bestsellers, and critical acclaim, but I think it's fair to say the Repairman Jack series took Paul to another plateau of popularity eventually. Um, what I'm curious about, Paul, has that been hard at times? And why I ask, there, there have been times where I've looked at the success of something like The Rising, and then I look at my friends like, like John sitting over there in the corner, and John, you and I have talked about this. I There are times where I feel guilty that... I'm doing something they're not. Um, you know, do you ever do you ever do that? Do you ever have those moments where you think, you know, why me? Why not Tom? Or does no, it, no, no. I'm, you know, I, I look at it as there's a certain amount of. I think I have a certain amount of market savvy. Okay. I also think I've had a certain amount of luck, and luck is really underrated in in. The writing career, right? I mean, the keep made my career. It, it put me on another level of uh, sales, right? I mean, we, you know, we went over seven figures in sales, and but the thing was, I was at the right place at the right time. If I wrote the keep today, you know, right? Um, but the thing was, everyone was doing small town horror, and I decided. I'm going to do I'm going to do widescreen horror. Right. And I'm going to I'm going to just up the ante and it's not going to be, you know, I'm, I'm going to make it historical. There's going to be a context and something you know you can identify. I mean, I was also a Robert Ludlum fan. Yeah. So, you know, I was into the whole conspiracy thing and don't trust anybody and what everybody anybody's saying, don't trust it. So I put that whole type of thing in with the horror novel and it's really a very gothic book right it's about a haunted castle really right but I put all the other socio-political elements into it and that that broadened it and all of a sudden you know and, and you know 
the movie people, you know, reduce it to Nazi and Nazis and vampires. But the thing is, that's not what it is. Right. But no one had seen anything like that. But see, the problem was, what they didn't understand when you took that to the whole Blaken thing at the end, you took it out of the familiar genres, and they didn't get it. Hollywood didn't care. Well, I didn't care about Hollywood, but the thing was, you know, Hollywood, I did care about it later when they no, screwed up the movie. No, but I think your movie. readers were fine with it. Yeah, the readers were fine with it, but they hadn't seen that. They were just, exactly. they were seeing all the whole, the small town horrors, you know, with, with somebody's moving into a haunted house in a, in a re- remote village or something like that, and everybody was doing it over and over and over again. So it's kind now, of like, it's you, kind of Tom like, wasn't doing it, yeah. but, you know, it was, and I it, it was something, it was something refreshing. It was kind of like, Writing a zombie novel when everyone else was doing serial killers. Right. Okay. Exactly. All right. Exactly. So then, how about you, Tom? I mean, was there overall? You guys have been friends thirty years. Was there ever a, a moment of, of resentment, or was it always you know good for Paul? You know, oh Christ! Yeah. yeah. I still read everything he writes. You know, I mean, yeah. it's like I don't need to, but like I, I love, I love what he does, so I read it. These are know? the answers I suspected, but yeah. you know. No, I, I, I and, and I'll ask. tell you the weirdest part of it. Since we started collaborating on this YA, and this is the weird part, because people had told us over the years, they said, "Yeah, you guys really have a really similar style." I really didn't pay much attention to it until we started collaborating. Yeah, <laughs> and I'll read the stuff that we shift back and forth. You know, right. When we're shifting the chapters, we we trade chapters that we're writing. I don't know who wrote what after a while. Do you? Well, that was our that was our agreement. You yeah. know, no ego. Right. You know, I'm going to rewrite you. You're going to rewrite me. Yeah. Right. And you know, whatever works best. Yeah. That's you know. That's the way Jesus. This and I is always good. But our stuff. This is not so, my little darling. You know, this is you know, something that we want to get out there and make it look good. And, we, and I noticed as time went by that our, that our styles really meshed. You know, they we both write the plain narrative style we don't no. we're not stylists the, the transparent style yeah 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 we're not trying to do some literary flower show right? i mean you know with, within a few weeks of trading something i can tell what i wrote and what you wrote but then later on that's what i mean when i go back to it i said who who did this yeah, right? that's, that's pretty good did i write that i'm, yeah. sure, I'm sure i wrote that <laughs> but that's good well now <laughs> We're talking about the Nocturnia series, that yeah, is the yeah, YA right. trilogy. Are you guys working on the third book? Right the now? third book is about eh, half done. Half done? Yeah. All right. More. Yeah, we're surprising ourselves with the third book, you know? We just, well, yeah. we bit off a lot more than we thought. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, we had all these, you know, bullet points of, you know, where it's going to go, and, and all of a sudden you say, well, let's not talk about that. Let's show it. Right? Yeah. And all of a sudden yeah. we're going to, you know, <laughs> we, we go into another dimension, you know, and it's just come back. You know, it's, it's, now, it, it's fun. writing YA has been an experience. Yeah? Yeah. Well, now, in that same vein, I mean, you guys were friends for 30 years. Tom, you know, of course, you, you're also part of Borderlands Press, you and your wife, Elizabeth. Yeah. At, you know, eventually, you ended up publishing Paul. Now, was there trepidation between either one of you? I mean, you know, friends are friends, business and bu- is business, and in this business... Business. We we know what can happen. Well, I learned that lesson with a guy named Harlan Ellis. <laughs> <laughs> Harlan Ellison. Hmm. We've been wanting him to mouth off about us, Dave. <laughs> it would be good for ratings. Please tell us, Tom. <laughs> yeah, Harlan. I used to be I used to be good friends with him years ago, years and years ago, and he he wanted to do this whole series of limited editions with him when we were starting. Borderlands, and we did this Star Trek novel. I don't want to get into the whole story, but Harlan never would let the book be finished, and he kept he kept delaying it, delaying it, delaying it, and he kept saying, "Go ahead, advertise it, collect the money, take them, get them, sell the book." And I don't like to collect money for a book that doesn't exist. Right. I don't. I mean, a lot of publishers do that. Yeah. Yeah. Pre-ordering. I, pre-ordering is the thing now. But yeah, that's I not, don't like doing that. Pre-ordering is fine if it, if the book is done. If the book right. is there, you buy it. But Elizabeth always said, don't let people pay you for something that's in your head. Right. And not, you know, in your hand. So we would not collect money in advance. And Harlan was bugging us and bitching and made us the Star Trek novel, uh, Star Trek script. It was called The City on the Edge of Forever. Right. And he was supposed to be writing this uh, 
mega introduction that was going to reveal all the buried bodies and all of Gene Roddenberry's sins and you know all this bullshit. And we kept saying, "Is it done yet? Is the introduction done? Can we can we sell it? Can we put the send the book to the printer?" It 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 got to be crazy. And and Harlan's thing was, "We are such good friends." We don't need a contract. <laughs> oh. Okay, that was like the worst thing you could ever do. I mean, right. everything I've ever done with Paul and anybody else, you know, you send them an agreement and that's... I, I insist on it. That's agreement. the agreement. My, my best friend, I said, we got to have it on. <laughs> of we course. got to have words on paper. Of yeah. course. This is, what, yeah. this is what you do. Right. Harlan wouldn't have any parts of it. He wouldn't sign a contract. Oh, we don't need that. We don't need that. We're friends. <laughs> Bullshit, <laughs> oh, right? Oh, oh. And, you know, and then I get a letter from his lawyer saying, you can't publish this until you get his introduction. It was crazy. Wow. It was a long story. But, yeah, friends are friends. But, business but, is business. But apropos to what you're saying, I mean, when he was saying we, we want to do, you know, a, a matched hardcover set of the adversary side. Well, that was her vision. She wanted to do that. And Which is a gorgeous set, by it, the way. It if is. The, if the absolutely listeners, gorgeous. If the listeners out there haven't seen it, Tom, are there, there are pictures of that on the website, yeah. right? Yeah. And there are still copies available. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was the thing. I was, you know, was, We printed too many. Tom said, you know, Tom said we're going to do a thousand copies of each of them. I said, you know, somebody, this is, the keep has been out for you know since eighty one. Yeah. You know, I mean, there are an awful lot of people who have the keep in all these books. I said, yeah, thousand. You know, okay. If you because you, you know I'm not a book <laughs> I'm not a bookseller. So I said, if he thinks he can sell a thousand, not, but I'm saying, oh geez, I hope he doesn't take a bath on this. And well, we had a great idea for the design, the concept. Oh yeah. I thought it was. Oh, it's one of the greatest limited editions ever. Yeah. I, I bought two copies, so there's oh, two out yeah. of a thousand sold. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, I mean, and, and it, so I mean, you know, like it sold like what? Maybe there's at at the most is one. One of them has two hundred copies left, but. Some of them, you know, some of them have less. Well, some people wanted only one book, and see, that was the problem. Right. They said, oh, "I want the key." You know, some people said, "I want the." the, the yeah, I renamed the the two of my original. And they wanted the but that's post, my original. stupid. I mean, the and then some people only wanted world. Night World. Yes, people. Uh, yeah. Well, all right, listeners. So that go, kind of screwed us up. Borderlandspress. Dot, it's dot net, right? Dot com or dot com. Borderlandspress. Dot com and and look at that and fucking buy one. That's uh, that's our sponsor for this week. Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. I don't I don't know if White Castle will actually be sponsoring this episode or not. But, right. You know. I'm a big White Castle uh, Castle fan. Yeah. Um. White oh, Castle. Man. I know y'all are listening. And I just want to point out that you know not only does that Paul Wilson live in Jersey, but he also sells. <laughs> 500 million more books than I do. And you send me merchandise, you could send him a little something. All right, well, Dave, before we wrap up, do you have send anything? Send it to Brian, okay? Yeah. <laughs> send it to, send to Paul Courtesy. I, did, I do want to say one thing. What's and, that? And it's, we touched on it way earlier, but this genre, this thing we do, that sounds a little mocking. thing we do. <laughs> <laughs> Cosa Nostra. You know, I don't think that I would ever have the friendships I've forged if were it not for that kind of thing. Because most people you talk to in your daily life, most of the friends I grew up with, they got no concept of what we do, the life, what we what we worry about, what we think about. What When you wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning and you're not thinking about dying, you're thinking about your next story. Yep. You know what I mean? It's like, it's but it's also the frames of reference. We can we can say things and it triggers things and then, you know I say pull the string <laughs> and there's all these people who know what I'm talking about yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful yeah. you know yeah. it's this culture you know the subculture that we're in yeah. and and I can do I can go any almost anywhere in the freaking country and say that and nobody goes what 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 are you yeah. talking about yeah I, I absolutely agree I mean I. I've been blessed with good friends. The guys I served in the Navy with, they're like brothers, but the best friends I've ever made are because of this business. Oh, absolutely. And, and I really want to make sure people understand that because right. I love this guy. I hate to say it, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you going to tell him you love him on the record here? I, I love you, man. <laughs> but, he's, but he's not Italian, so it's hard for him. 
Well, no, I'm half Scotch, half Irish, and you know, <laughs> this is a hug. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I'm all I'm all Irish, but I, I'll tell you I love you both. And, uh, you, you guys have been. We awful, love you too, man. <laughs> you guys have been awfully fucking good to me over the years, and I want you to know I appreciate it. you've been good to all of us. Mm-hmm. I think I speak for everybody. Uh, you know, I, I got to yeah. say something about Brian King. He's one of these guys that he has context for this genre, and there, there's so many people out there. You know, and they're readers, and they're even writers. And they don't they don't have the context that you know? I you, you, you say Henry Cutner to a lot of these people, and they don't know who you're talking about. You say it to Brian. Brian knows <laughs> all the stories. Uh, Brian said, "How can I help promote your Kickstarter? I want oh, this book to right. happen." <laughs> but see, that's the thing. A lot of people, they their their cultural history starts when they woke up. Yeah, it didn't start. They, they, whatever came before doesn't matter to them. For me, it was yeah, uh, sad. That's it terrible. was it was King's Dance Macabre and uh, Carl Edward Wagner had a thing in Twilight Zone magazine, a list of like I think it was like a hundred obscure horror novels you've never read, and I would just, you know, like the John, you might Dave, you might remember in the seventies the Marvel Comics bubblegum cards and you had the checklist on the sure, track. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I, I used that article and, and King's book like one of those fucking checklists. Well, I've never heard of this. I'd haunt the used bookstore until I found it, you know? I did the so, same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that list. I'm pretty sure it was Twilight Zone. Yep. Magazine. I know I looked at that one. Yeah. And obviously, Dan McCarthy, I think we all read that. But, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. the thing is, you went and investigated. Yeah. yeah. When, How many did people start, did not? when did you start reading the, the genre stuff? How old were you? 13. See? That's yeah. the magic age. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was. I'm not sure the age. I, I started with comics, and uh, then it was the first three books were King Salem's Lot, Night Shift, and then Paul's the Keaton. God, that has to blew so, you away. It, it did, you know, and I, I never <laughs> looked back. So I have such fond memories of Salem's Lot because uh, yeah. I bought it through the book club, and never anywhere in the you know there's a book guild, it doesn't say vampire, literary guild, right? never says the word vampire. Right, that's right. But it sounded right. intriguing by this guy who wrote Carrie, which I had never read. And so I'm reading through the book, and I'm seeing this and saying, oh, this starts to look like a vampire. He's <laughs> going he's going to find another way to explain it and blow it. Right. Know? And then I came to the part where <laughs> he had built the Aurora models. You know, the, the kid yeah. had built the Aurora models. I said, holy shit, he's one of us. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then all of a sudden it was real vampires. And I'm saying... Oh, he's a mutant. Because he's one of us. Up, when we grew up, we did that shit. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, the, the kid, did. the kid was who I That's guess. so true. Yeah, well, it is. I'm saying. <laughs> oh my god, it's one of those one of the best moments of reading I've ever had when I realized that whoever this Stephen King guy is, he's one of us. Oh, and yeah, how many know? people read that? It didn't mean a thing to. Oh me. yes, I know. Didn't mean the a kid thing. was right. my favorite character in the novel because oh, really? that's who I was at that point. Yeah. You know, so. Mm-hmm. Well, guys, that's thank- who I had been. You know? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming in, uh, yeah. listeners. Please check out the Nocturnia series. Uh, the first two books, definitely not Kansas and Family Secrets, are of course on sale now. And Dave, we got an exclusive. They're about you missed it. You had a long weekend. Oh my, you have no idea. Yeah, the, the third book they're they're working on now. Yeah. So it's called the Silent Ones. The Silent Ones. Yeah. Yes. Which is what we will be eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you. Why did we not have that on video? I, I don't know that would have been, that, that would have been. I just, I, I just want to say before we stop here that, you know, because you know, I'm rarely serious, but be serious. What? Like, that these two guys, because, you know, I'm not, I don't write horror fiction. You right. Know? I'm, I do other stuff. But these two gentlemen have never been anything but nice and talk to me whenever I've been to a convention. The first, the first time and on, every time I see him, especially Tom, always shakes my hand, always says, how are you doing? You know, and, and F. Paul, too, you guys are some of the nicest guys I've ever met. And I like Brian, I love you both. And it's an honor to know both of uh, you. Yep. Seriously. I mean, we've, we've talked on the show many yeah. times about how people react to you at cons yes. once they figure out you're not a writer or an yeah. editor and you can't do shit for them. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. these, these guys are not those guys. No, no, so, no yeah. I, you know. 
I, I remember. Uh, I'm afraid you are an editor. <laughs> now. <laughs> That's it. I'm a secret editor. No, I, I remember the first time I met these guys, and and they were like just so nice, and they were like, "Oh, how's it going?" And we had like a conversation about books, and I was like, "Well, this is different." Because <laughs> usually, like Brian's like, "Hey, have you met Dave?" And they look at me like, eh, "Whatever." Yeah. <laughs> so. Or the, or they ask you if, if you can get me to blurb their. their yeah. Well, you know, no. There's, there's that. Yeah. There's. Time. But you know what? Yeah. One of the reasons I think, and both of us have been through this. We've had authors that we've admired tremendously, and then we've run into them at conventions, and we found out they were total assholes. <laughs> and I remember you and I both, and we did this. Oh, Anderson! We, we, no, I was hoping you wouldn't say his name. Okay. Can you edit that? No, we cannot edit out Paul Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> we had the, he wasn't the really, exact same experience. It was just that I offered to buy him a beer, and he said, what do you mean by a beer? Do you mean an ale? Do you mean this? I said, what? What are you talking about? But anyway, the thing is, I decided, and, and you decided probably, I'm not going to be that guy. Exactly. Right. I want to be, exactly. you know, the guy. I want to be just another guy, which really I am. You know, it's, I don't take this terrible. I, I don't admit, take the success yeah. seriously. Don't I'm believe, just, you know, the, the first time I met you guys, because obviously, band. you know, I read, yeah. I read the Keep when I was in college, and Blood of the Lamb. I don't remember exactly when that came out, yeah. but about the same time, which are two hugely impressive books to me. So I'm like a little nervous, you know, to meet these guys, right. and they're just the nicest guys ever, and. Yeah. You know, well, and, yeah. and you know, Jesus, myself, Levin, you know, Golden. I, I think all of us watching you guys. Well, okay, that's who the fuck we want to be. And and I'm not under the same restrictions as you. I can say that I I never wanted to be T M Wright <laughs> <laughs> or Harlan Ellison yeah. or, or anybody else that we've talked yeah. about on this show. The other thing I have to yeah. say is is as you and I continue to grow older, I hope this is the kind of relationship that we. Have. Well, we continue I, to have. I think we do now. I don't know about that. Dude. Well, yeah. <laughs> we won't get into that kind of thing stuff on the air. But yeah. I agree, man. Yeah. All right, well, gentlemen, thank you so much. Yes, thank uh, we're you. gonna let you hit the bar now. And Absolute pleasure. This yes, pleasure. This was not work at all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Dave. Let's right. Uh, let's That's go it. back to the studio. All right. All right, and I do want to mention that that interview was brought to you by Stephen Kozanowski from October 8th to the 10th. All three of Stephen's novels are on sale. That means that for just two ninety nine or free if you're a Kindle Unlimited user, you can get a copy of Brain Eater Jones. Part comedy, part horror, part mystery, part bizarro, Brain Eater Jones is the story of a zombie privatized bourbon-fueled rampage through a gritty Prohibition-era urban jungle as he tries to solve his own murder and seek revenge against his killers. Brain Eater Jones was nominated for a Voice Arts Award in 2014 for narrator Stephen Rampisi's audiobook performance, and it was also named one of the top books of 2013 by World Horror Grandmaster Brian Keane. Hey, that's me. Hey. <laughs> Get your copy on Amazon today. And again, Stephen is S-T-E-P-H-E-N, Kozanowski, K-O-Z-E-N-I-E-W-S-K-I. S-K-I? S-K-I. He's yeah. inventing new letters and sounds. Yeah, well, you know, yeah. I'm a grandmaster. I can do that. Shut the fuck up. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Good wait. God. We're laughing too much. Yeah. We need to be serious. Oh, oh that's yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. We forgot. Yeah. You know, I wanted I wanted to introduce the show as Welcome Back to Brian Keene Complains About Things like, for an Hour, yeah. otherwise known as the Dave and Coop Crab Show. Yes, yes. And and I, we, are, we are, you know, an hour into the show at this point, and Coop and I have not discussed crab. We have to, not. You have to, not. To which I not. say to our critics, suck it. Yeah. <laughs> because we... I mean, we yeah. could talk about what we got for dinner, you know, when yeah. we all went out. Yeah. Because I had the big, huge, don't come fucking near me crab kick. <laughs> so there you go. And I, I got stuck with the bill. Deal with it. <laughs> Oops, now I'm complaining. Poor shit. I paid it. I paid my part. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I just I needed to complain for that guy on iTunes who, yeah. who said that the show is Brian Keene complains for an hour. Yeah. Because okay. apparently he yeah. hasn't read my blog over yeah. the last twenty years. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, Brian, I I go on iTunes and I see Brian Keene complains for an hour. I'm tuning in. I don't know. Even if I'm not on the show, I want to hear that. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, I I like that. Hey. Well, you, you could listen to uh, you know Kelly Owens' Buttercup of Doom. Um, no, I, you know, I can't even make fun of her. Uh, I was listening on the way up to Massachusetts, and she had this epic rant on Walmart yeah. that had me rolling. It was funny. It was insightful. It was really good. 
You know, I haven't heard that episode. I, I, I'm way on behind on Stitcher. I do listen to her show, even though I make fun of her all the time. Yeah. You know, but I do listen. I just have, I haven't heard it one yet. She wants me to be on as a guest and, and tell like stories about going to the grocery store because, you know, that's... Right. Yeah, I don't know. I do think she needs a guest once in a while. Yeah. I, it's a hard slog to do it. Like, you, you've done this solo shows. I've done, yeah, five yeah. solo shows, yeah. and it's a hard it, it's fucking tough. slog. It's tough. Yeah. 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 It's just, because after a while, you get tired of hearing your own voice. You know right. what I mean? Right, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, I, you know, it's a lot easier when you have at least two people, or, you know, like, here, like, three. Yeah. You know, you can talk together and stuff. And yeah, you can bounce stuff off of each talk other. Talk about you crab. Can, yeah. Laugh at things. Yeah. yeah. Complain about Complain things. Complain about things. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sounds good. Steal other people's podcast titles. Well, I thought, I thought you, like, stole people's ideas and, and well, that's psychically. psychically. Yeah, Psych- that's psychically. Psych- yeah. Because God knows you get psychic powers. That's what you want to do with them. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, that's the first thing I think of. Yeah, you, you remember I'm complaining? I, I, I meant to ask you this. This is going to be real quick. And Coop, I'm sorry to bring this up while you're sitting here. Have you been watching the new Doctor Who? No, I have not. Okay. I gave up on Doctor Who uh, when Matt Smith took over. Um, but in examining this, it's not even Matt Smith. I'll tell you why I gave up on Doctor Who. Doctor Who used to be this thing Saturdays on PBS. Right. You know, it was the Tom Baker era. And I was the only person I knew that was watching it. And it was something secret. And it was something that was just mine. You know, the internet, fandom, none of this shit That didn't exist. Yeah. Right. right. Um, now, every hipster fucking douchebag and their <laughs> brother is into Doctor Who, and, you know, you can go to Hot Topic and buy Doctor Who Chotsky, you know. I, I'm that way with most of pop culture. I, I, it's this, it's the same with comic books. Now, everybody's a fucking comic book fan. Well, you know, not me anymore. Everybody's a Doctor Who fan now. Not <laughs> me anymore. Um, you so, know. so you're just being, you know, grumpy in reaction. I, yeah, I'm old, is what it is. <laughs> I, I'm old, and I just, I don't give a fuck. You know, um, as far as I'm concerned, Peter Parker married Mary Jane, and they had a kid, and eventually he retired, and Miles Morales took over, and none of these fucking reboots ever happened. Peter Parker got old, he got fat, he got bald, uh, you know, eventually the Doctor and K-9 and Romana went off in the TARDIS, and they never came back, you know? Uh, these stories should have an end at some point. Okay. That's my thought. I, I was just gonna bring up it's fucking terrible. So <laughs> well, I've heard. Yeah. I, I've heard nothing but it, complaints. It's it's almost unwatchable. I've never been a big fan. I never got into the Tom Baker thing. I've seen him, but it was just like I just not really doing anything. Right. For me. Phoebe loves Doctor Who. Yeah, so I'll watch it with her. Yeah, it, it's virtually unwatchable. Like it's just the the scripts are so bad. Yeah. Yeah. I liked yeah. when they brought it back. I loved Christopher Eccleston's portrayal of the Doctor. Because he was a bastard. Yeah. I mean, and if you think about it realistically, okay, this is a man who's 700 years old. He travels through time. He has no sense of place, no sense of self, really. Um, every companion who he, he, every person who he lets get close to him eventually leaves. This motherfucker should be dark and crazy and a bastard. Um, and I thought Christopher Eccleston brought that out very well. And I liked, uh, who was the guy after him? David Tennant? I think so. I yeah. don't really know. Yeah. I like that because they brought back some of the old shit. They brought back K-9. They brought back Sarah Jane. There were touchstones there for old people like me. But, yeah, after after that, I just... See, I, I've... Know. Like I said, I saw some of the Tom Baker. Didn't anyway, the new show came on. I started to watch it. And, like you said, the actual film was really good. Then we got to an episode where it's flashing the aliens. I'm like, I'm done. You know? Yeah. And I never watched it again until the new guy. Yeah. Who's... Is it Peter? Peter Capaldi? Yes, yep. yeah. Well, actually, I don't mind. I think he's actually because he's kind of whack, crazy, right? Type, you know. But this, the past season wasn't so bad. This season, there's only been three episodes, but it's terrible. It's yeah. painful. Oh, I hear yeah. bad things about. Yeah, it's you know, not. I, I was just curious if you're still watching or no. not. So. You know, Doctor uh, Who is kind of like a Game of Thrones with me. You know, <laughs> like if I see a meme on Facebook or you know online or something, and I don't know what it is, if it's a vaguely science fiction setting, I assume it has something to do with Doctor Who. <laughs> um, <laughs> if it's a vaguely fantastic setting, I figure it has to do with Game of Thrones. Okay, well, that's, if yeah. it's uh, some stupid, you know, something to do with zombies. Or a kid wearing a Confederate hat. I assume it has to do with the uh, Walking Dead. Uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've never seen any of these. I, I don't need to. Yeah. I don't need to. No, I mean, because it's right there in yeah. uh, you know, it's there in social you know, media. In, in Doctor Who, I I find 
intriguing that this ancient British TV show is now the darling topic of conversation of these 22 and a half year old puss heads that are writing poetry on laptop computers at fucking Starbucks. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't get it. Like, you know, I, I recently learned that, um, that it, uh, was out of circulation for a while. Cause I remember when I was a kid, I do remember, you know, the telephone booth flying through, flying through space. Right. You know, I remember this vision on television and it's not something that I watched. Right. You know, as a kid, I didn't watch it when I was, you know, growing up, but I, I do remember seeing that. I don't think I've ever watched an episode. Um, and I, I just don't get it. I, I don't get, I, I don't get the fascination. I mean, if people like it, Hey, you know what? Cool. Power to you. But, you know, when something old like that has such a resurgence, you know, recently, like uh, how everybody found it fashionable, fashionable to be a longtime Johnny Cash fan. Right. After the movie. Which pissed me the fuck off. Because um, you, know, you guys were making fun of me for listening to Johnny Cash back in 95. I don't think we ever made fun of you for listening to Johnny Cash. I, I, I did. Oh, did? Yeah, okay. I did. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> But like I'm not a country music fan at all, but that's like the one guy where I'll say I get no, I, I just why think, you, like, you know like yeah. uh, it, it just seems to me to be you know bandwagon and oh, why aren't yeah. you on it? You know I mean if I wanted that if I if I wanted that type of bullshit you know I I you know change my change my hat every year right you know, <laughs> you know it's like you know all right well you know now. You know, now I'm a Broncos fan, and now I'm a Giants fan. Hey, you know, knock it off. Knock it off. You know, I mean, like what you like. And if that's really what you like, and if that's your first exposure to it, and that's what you like, all right, cool. I agree. But, you know, I don't I don't get it. I don't get it. Uh, I, in pop culture references are always lost on me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, was a, there was another meme. We should just ha- we could just have a Coop doesn't understand these memes hour. <laughs> well, but when I say the uh, Hurricane Joe, what the hell was it? Saying? Hurricane Joaquin. Oh, okay, Joaquin. Okay, uh, Joaquin, and it had a yeah. picture. Joaquin. Of, yeah, it was Joaquin Phoenix. Wa- okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, and it had a picture of like the hurricane track with these faces on it, and somebody on Facebook and I, and I apologize. I'm not trying to be vague, and I'm not trying to protect your identity. I'm really that freaking dumb and I don't remember on whose page I was having this conversation and they were like you know there was a bunch of people that were uh, responding and liking this thing and I'm like I don't get it I, I don't know who that is and apparently it's uh, River Phoenix's brother who played Johnny Cash in that movie hold on <laughs> <laughs> that is the level of caring that I have <laughs> Right there. You people that are listening, this is one of the times I wish the show was on video, just because you'd see Coop's expression right there. Yeah. It was perfect. It, it was, you know, I, I don't know who it is. I don't I don't get pop culture. I don't. I don't I, I, I don't follow it. I don't have I never watch TV. I don't know your shows. Yeah. I'm, I'm I distance myself from the whole fucking social I'm, experiment. I'm too old for pop culture. Um, you know, and, and I don't begrudge, you know, David, my oldest son, he's t- about to be turned 25, you know, he reads Marvel and DC voraciously, and, you know, he tells me that, that you know, Doctor Doom, or Beyonder destroyed the universe, and Doctor Doom is God now, and he made a new planet, and there's there's seven Wolverines, but the real Wolverine's dead. I just, I don't care. It's, 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 it sounds as coherent to me as that phone call from Nicholas Pichon that we played last week. <laughs> Nothing is that you know, anger. But I get that he's excited about it, and he loves it, and he's enjoying it. Well, that's great. Yeah. It's not for me. Yeah, I, you know, I just... The the only thing like that, like I said uh, on last week's show, Days of Our Lives has sucked me back in. <laughs> and the reason it has is because they're targeting it towards people my age. It's, hey, you watched us in the 80s. Here's all those characters again. You know? But, uh... No, yeah. I don't know. Well, you don't, don't look at me and say you know because I don't. There you go. Everyone on Facebook this week make Days of Our Lives memes and and post them on Coop's page. You're about I, I may recognize that it's not Doctor Who, Walking Dead, or Game of Thrones. <laughs> there you well, that's, go. That's a step in the right That direction. would fall into yeah. soap opera bullshit. Yeah. 
I look at memes and I'm like, does it have Grumpy Cat in it or not? That shows that tells me if I'm interested. <laughs> I was just like I said, a lot of people were using that that photo of Joe Hill and I with the susical background to make memes this week. The best one I saw, and the reason it's my favorite is because the guy used a still from Day of the Dead. Uh, when Joe Pilato was being ripped apart. Oh, right, by the right. Yeah, yeah, I saw this. It wasn't Walking Dead yeah. or Game of Thrones or Doctor Who. He he used something that from pop culture that I recognize, <laughs> that I have a familiarity with. <laughs> so, all right, well, Dave, yeah. speaking of, of things that are big in pop culture right now, let's talk about the novel that everyone this year is raving about, Paul Tremblay's A Head Full of Ghosts. Now, we've had Paul on the show. Um, we've talked about the book in several episodes, but you know we, because talking about it at any length will spoil the fucking book. It's impossible to talk about this book without spoiling right. it. Right. Yeah. So uh, one final warning, you know, because I, I know uh, a couple of you, a couple of you were mad that I spoiled Mr. Robot, which you actually didn't. I didn't, but you yeah. know what? The listeners are always right. Did no, you complain I, about it? <laughs> um, no. No, I didn't complain about it. Actually, I raved about it. Yeah. Um, if you have not read A Head Full of Ghosts, now is the time to turn off your radio or your computer or whatever you're listening to this on and come back next week so that you can listen to our interview with Jeff Strand and uh, listen to Dave and Coop talk about crabs and me complain about things for an hour. Yeah. 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 You know what? Sounds good. <laughs> <Just joking. laughs> All right. So, head full of ghosts. Head Dave, of ghosts. why don't you get us started? No, no, no. I want you to start. All right. Um, I mean, I just I have random thoughts. Yeah, that's um, what I have too, but I'm curious. I'm curious to hear your theory about the book if it's the same as mine or not. All right. Um, first of all, let me, let me talk about things I appreciated. Um, I thought the usage... Of the Richard Scary books, yes, was genius, brilliant. absolute genius, yes. Because that is an emotional touchstone. You want to talk about pop culture? Mm. That is an emotional touchstone that our generation immediately remembers, that my oldest son generation remembers, and that my youngest son, who's seven, remembers. Mm. We all remember turning the pages of the Richard Scary books, and yeah, there's bunnies and there's foxes, but what are you doing every time? You're looking for goddamn gold bug, right? You know, and they and they do that in the book, and the fact that these Richard Scary books then become one of the primary tools of terror that the demon is using, and and in my opinion, one of the most effective, creepiest parts of the book. You know, when uh, when her sister is is you know writing the new stories in the margins right. of the Richard Scary books with the illustrations. That for me, that was one of the creepiest parts of the fucking book. So I thought that was brilliant. Um, you know, obviously the the book is a meta examination, not just of demonic, the demonic possession trope, but of the horror genre itself. I mean, it wears its influences on its sleeves. You know, Evil Dead, The Exorcist, um, Session Nine. You know, H.P. Lovecraft and his mythos becomes a, a huge part of the story. Um, I love that aspect of it. You know, ultimately. Is it a book about demonic possession, or is it a book about people being possessed by pop culture? Which is why I'm so delighted you brought up Doctor Who and, and mm -hmm. Coop's comments on that. Which we hadn't planned, it wasn't in the show notes. Right. But because that's exactly what a head full of ghosts is about. You know, does she have a head full of ghosts, or does she have a head full of information? You know, she even says, it says in the book, she's possessed by the collective of ideas. And... That really spoke to me. I, I've always been fascinated with writer Alan Moore's uh, terminology. He, he has this thing called idea space where he believes there is a realm, a dimension, whatever you want to call it, where ideas exist and that creative people tap into that simultaneously and they create zeitgeist. Mm -hmm. um, a great example, you know, Danny Boyle in the same year, Danny Boyle is working on a zombie movie called 28 Days Later which features a main character named Jim and a, a strong black female protagonist. Um, and Robert Kirkman is working on what will become a comic book series and then a TV series about zombies with uh, another strong black female protagonist. And some schmuck named Brian Keene <laughs> is working on a novel uh, with a main character named Jim and a strong black female protagonist. S separately and independently of each other. And they all come out at the same time. So, 
coincidence, or did we tap into something? I, I've always felt that this theory is absolutely true. Yeah. And <laughs> I've, I've said that, you know, you connect to this, and that each person, you know, like you said, that, that can tap into the same idea. But I also feel that, that when you tap into this this space, whatever you want to call it, that everybody has a finite amount of time they're allowed to access this space. Right. And some people have a lifetime, and some people have... 10 minutes. I agree. You know, and, you know. Yeah, Stephen King is still yeah. tapped in. He's still tapped Ted in. Ted Klein, tapped out. Tapped out, You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I have two different theories. I've read the book twice. I should mention, you know, I read an advanced reading copy before it came out. And I read it again this week on my Kindle. Right. Because I wanted to refresh my, my memory before we talked about this. Um, I do not believe she was possessed by a demon. Uh, I believe she was possessed by this idea space. You know, all the indicators are there. You know, she when the priest tries to get the demon's name, the demon, the quote unquote demon, uses a love, a fictional Lovecraft creation, which they then figure out is from Lovecraft's pantheon. Mm-hmm. And you know, the the writer on the reality show had his Miskatonic University shirt, so that's where she picked it up. And you know. Uh, the blog entries, they talk about, well, this came from The Exorcist. This came from, you know, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. It. I don't think she was possessed by a demon. I think she was possessed by idea space. I think she had tapped into the zeitgeist. That's my one theory. But then this morning, before you guys got here, and I was just, I was going through my Kindle, looking at my notes, another idea occurred to me. What if it was the younger daughter? Thank you. Who was possessed? This is my theory. The whole time. Yes. And I started going back yeah. through the book, <laughs> and <laughs> I think it's there in no, the subtext. It and is. Yeah. Now I changed my answer. I think it's the little girl, Mary, the narrator. Mary is possessed by the demon. It's not her sister. Yeah. Because how else do you explain the weird shit that she sees in the book that there's no other way to explain but supernatural? Right. That there has to be a demonic possession, but it's not her sister. Right. It's affecting her sister. And like you said, I think the idea space is definitely part of it. And I'd love to have Tremblay on the show again and, and ask Well, we're going to have to. But, but yeah. I totally, through the whole book, especially at the end, when they're in that coffee shop. Yep. And there's the, it keeps getting cold. You know? And they're, why is it so cold? Why is it so yep. cold? And I'm like... It, That's what yeah, sealed it for yeah, me. Yeah. It's like, it's, I, I, I felt this maybe about a third, halfway through the book... The sequence where, and I thought this was the creepiest part, where the sister is hiding out in the cardboard house in her in her bedroom, right, and doing weird shit. That 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 part in the basement. Those are like to, for me were the two really creepy parts. But I'm like, I think that this is the demon fucking with her. I don't think it's her sister. Yeah, you know, and and just the way the the story is structured. Now again. It's an eight-year-old girl, so you want to talk about unreliable narrator? Well, you know? and not only that, <laughs> yeah. but the. Her narration when she's eight, yeah. Her narration in modern day, and her narration as the, the, blogger. the blogger, yeah. Three different voices, exactly. Yeah, you know, the, I did that too. Multiple yeah, there's voices. The multiple voices. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, I totally. That was my theory. I was just curious to see what your theory was. Yeah. I was like, oh, excited. Well, he didn't see what I but, saw. Baby. But see, yeah. that's the thing. I did not pick up on that the first time uh, I read the book. I, that's that was my theory. Like I said, about you know, a third of the way through. It wasn't until literally this morning before you guys got here, I thought, holy fuck. Yeah. She's the one that was possessed the whole time. Yeah. yeah. You know? So. Yeah, because you can't, like, you're reading the book and, you know, it's structured in a way where you can say, oh, none of this is supernatural. But there's some stuff that happens. There's no other way to explain it. Right. Than being like there's a, something weird going on. And that's that's my theory. Now, I could be totally wrong. You know, I'm not no, the I, smartest person I, on the planet. I but, think we're both right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even like. Uh, the older the older sister says, you know, Mary has to be in the room when we do the exorcism. Right. You know. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah. I. Because yeah, Mary Christ. is always around when something fucked up happens. Exactly. Not anybody else. And it's always her. And yeah. The blanket scene. Yeah. Her sister isn't there in the room. Right. You know. Yeah. So it's the demon fucking with yeah. her. Yeah. Same with the basement. Yep. Same because the basement. sister was upstairs. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, you can say, well, okay, well, she projected herself in the basement. I'm like, no, 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 This is Mary's brain. The demon fucking So if that's the case, yeah. did the demon then cause the older sister's mental breakdown? Yes, I feel. Okay. Yeah, I totally felt like... And the father's yeah, collapse. The father's collapse, and which, destroying the whole family. Which was a great throwback to Amityville Horror, oh, yeah. by the way. Yeah. You know? um, no, I mean, the references in the, the, the 
the influence in this book. Like if you've read horror, well, and even horror, even the in jokes, yeah. which I always love. I know Coop hates them. Um, <laughs> you know, John and Sarah Langan. Yeah. Yeah, as the parents. Well, yeah. he changed the name. Like I know this because Paul told me. Right, it was based on John and Sarah. Yeah. Um, the psychiatrist Stephen Graham Jones. Yeah, I that, that, was, that was funny. Yeah, you know, but yeah, what a. <laughs> those don't. Those don't ever. Yeah, you know, really. Unless I, I mean, do it, it de- well, unless I do it, and then you can give me shit about it. Well, that's different. <laughs> it, it, dep- it depends on the level. You know, it depends on the level that you do it. Well, but I, I, I would yeah. say that I don't do it as much anymore. But no, not as much as that. We'll save that for the same show where we talk about you and writing. Then, we'll, <laughs> then you can turn <laughs> up, turn around on me about in jokes and fiction. But again, I mean, we've said this before. This is easily the best thing I've read in a year. Absolutely, the book is so well written, so well structured. There's so much, you know, thought that went into this. I, I am just, I was blown away by it. And, and I also, I read this in one sitting. I stayed up till five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I'm like, I started reading. I'm like, God damn it, I'm not going to bed till I'm done with this. What? Now, of course, I did at five o'clock in the morning. I've totally freaked myself out reading this damn book. <laughs> I have all the lights on in the room, but <laughs> it's, it's amazing to me. We live in this society where people love to tear shit down. Yeah, and you're not seeing that with head full of ghosts. You go on Amazon. Um, there are very, very few bad reviews, and even the bad reviews are like, you know, it's stuff like, well, it was too short. Uh, or, you know, I didn't like the blog entries. But they don't have a problem with the story itself. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, the cross-spectrum of our peers. I mean, you've got, you know, pulp writers like myself or Lee or Brian Smith. You've got literary stylists like Sarah Langan or, you know, Nick Kaufman. Everybody is raving about this mm-hmm. book across the spectrum. Yeah, know? it's, it's like I said, it's the best thing I've read in a year. I mean, the last thing I enjoyed this much was... Uh, Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is the best thing I've ever seen. And I, I think I might like this even better. I mean, it, this is really, really a really great book. Yeah. I mean. Absolutely. I, I agree. I was just blown away. And I, I'm, you know, like I said, you, you and I have the same theory now. So I'm yep. excited about that. And uh, um, I, I love, by the way, the blog entries. Although this is my one sort of complaint about the book. I don't think they should have revealed that Mary was the blogger until the end. Yeah, yeah. I didn't like the fact that we found that in the middle. Although I suspected it right away, but I think that he should have saved that for the end. Now I'm not Paul. Yeah. And Paul and I have not discussed this, but as a writer, I would suggest the reason he did that because that's a big reveal. Yeah. Oh. It's and if you reveal it at the end, the reader is totally going to miss the temperature dropping in the cafe and her breath fogging. Yeah. Um, they're going to be focused on that. I actually, I didn't like the blog entries because of the narrative voice of that character. She annoyed the <laughs> fuck out of me. She reminded me of, of well, know, it was supposed to be an annoying Tumblr. Well, I, I know. Yeah. And, and he, he, he nails it. And I he, mean, he was perfect. At yeah. It. I, that's the response he was trying to elicit yeah. and it worked. Yeah. You I know? mean, that's why so. I, you know, one of the reasons why I liked it because he nailed the horror that is Tumblr. Not yeah. quite because Tumblr is a million times worse than that. <laughs> so, you know, the only thing Tumblr is good for is porn. So, <laughs> well, yeah, I, uh, so I, yeah, for that's, that's, you know, that's pretty much what I wanted to say about it. Um, I, you know, if you're listening to this, I, I assume you already read it, but yeah. For in case you didn't, um, just well, we just it. spoiled the yeah, fucking book for you. Doesn't matter. You read it anyway because it. it's it's amazing. Because you may have a different interpretation as well. I, and if anybody has a different interpretation, please write in with it. So yeah, we can talk about. It. Um, if you're gonna put it on our Facebook page, uh, I don't put it on our Facebook page. Well, you can, but just mark it spoilers and then you know hit return a couple times. Oh, yeah. Uh, actually, don't, don't do that. E- e- email it to the horror show with Brian Keen at Outlook.com. Yeah, there you go. Do that. Just do that. All right. All right. Well, one more time, I do want to mention this week's episode of the horror show is brought to you by Stephen Kozanowski. From October 8th to the 10th, all three of his novels are on sale. That means that for just 99 cents or free if you're a Kindle Unlimited user, you can get a copy of The Ghoul Archipelago. Christine Morgan of the Horror Fiction Review and the Fossil Lake Anthology says, Smugglers, drug cartels, exotic islands, renegade military vessels, pirates, religious fanatics, cannibalism, virtual reality, porn programs, political scheming, action, adventure, bloodshed, betrayal. This book would be jam-packed with excitement even without the zombie apocalypse going on. 
There's also plenty of drippy dismemberments, disembowelments, decapitation, and all manner of gory good times. Get your copy on Amazon.com today. And once again, thank you to Stephen for sponsoring yes. this episode. Yes. Thank you, Stephen. Um, folks, we hope you enjoyed it. We know it was an overtime episode. Hopefully it was worth it. Um, if you're scrolling around on Amazon buying Stephen's books as you should, you know, supporting our advertisers, why not pick up a copy of Coop's Answers of Silence while you're at it as uh, well? Good idea. And uh, if there's something you would like Jeff, uh, or excuse me, Coop, Dave, or I to talk about, um, I'll tell you why. I did that in a minute. Uh, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, or our website, thehardshowwithbriankeen.com. Oh, oh, I forgot. Important news. Oh, we topped 500. Yes, yeah. we cracked the 500 leg barrier on Facebook yes, in we two did. months. Wow. Yes, we so, did. So, uh, next goal, obviously, is 1,000. The best thing you can do for this show is tell somebody to listen to it. Exactly. And get them to like our Facebook page. And we're picking up new listeners every week. Yeah. And uh, now that Dave has the password to the network's website... Uh, this is not a good we, idea. We can, <laughs> well, they gave it to me first. That's an even well worse idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can promise that the show will be up on time. So maybe. We'll see. Uh, Stephanie is always fighting that guy with the iPad. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Next week... An interview with Jeff Strand, uh, the funniest man in horror, but the interview itself is pretty serious. Uh, so we'll have that for you, and I'm sure we'll have some other nonsense. The Horror Show is available on iTunes, Android, Roku, Stitcher, and all other platforms via Project iRadio. Visit them online at projectiradio.com. To advertise on The Horror Show, contact Jess, J-E-S-S, at projectiradio.com. And again, if someone out there would like to sponsor... Coop's launch of the Hellraiser rocket. <laughs> Contact Jess. We'll work something out for you. Once again, Coop's book, Answers of Silence, is available now in paperback and Kindle. Go to Amazon.com and pick that up. And uh, until next week, I don't really have a sign-off other than, you know, allow yourself to be possessed by the collective of ideas. Doc, what else can you head say? Full of ghosts. Yeah. Coop, you got anything to say? No, not off the top of my head that's going to top that, but you've had all week to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> I, right. I was getting here yesterday. <laughs> all right, folks, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.